Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast of More Sensitive Analysis of Hexavalent Chromium in Water and Soil Extracts. I'm Laura Bush, Editor-in-Chief of LCGC, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational webcast presented by LCGC North America and sponsored by Dionix Corporation. Dionix is a global leader in the manufacture and marketing of chromatography and extraction systems, consumables, and software for chemical analysis. This web seminar is part of an ongoing series to provide solutions for pressing application challenges. We have a few important announcements before we begin. First, this webcast is designed to be interactive, so we hope that you'll participate. After the presentations, we'll have a live Q&A session. And you can submit a question at any time by typing it in the Submit Questions box, which is located in the lower left-hand corner of your browser window. We'll answer as many questions as we can during today's broadcast. If you look under the presentation window, you'll also see a row of buttons that can be very useful. The Enlarge Slides button does just what the name suggests, and you can click it at any time. And the slides will advance automatically during the event. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, just click the Help button. I would now like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker today is Kirk Chassanal, who is a Product Applications Manager at the Center of Excellence at Dionics Corporation. Kirk has been involved in the field of ion chromatography for 22 years at Dionics, with special emphasis on chemical and petrochemical applications. He has a BS in Chemistry from St. Louis University and has authored technical articles for LCGC, Hydrocarbon Processing, and the Journal of Environmental Monitoring. He's an active member of several ASTM committees, including D2, Petroleum Products and Lubricants, Elemental Analysis Subcommittee 2.03, D3, Gaseous Fuels, and E15, Industrial and Specialty Chemicals. He also serves as the technical contact for D755009, the standard test method for determination of ammonium, alkali, and alkaline earth metals in hydrogen and other cell feed gases by ion chromatography. Also joining us today is Stuart DeGurney. Stuart is currently a research scientist in the Office of Quality Assurance at the New, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. His responsibilities include conducting certification audits of environmental testing laboratories, reviewing DEP programs for adherence to quality principles, implementing innovative environmental technologies, developing new reference materials to ensure test method validity, and developing staff training courses. In previous roles, Stewart has been a manager of analytical laboratories for Argus Division of Whitco Corporation and bureau chief for inorganic and radiological services for the NJDEP, in addition to holding other positions in state and federal government agencies. He received his BS in chemistry from Brooklyn College and an MS in inorganic and physical chemistry from Indiana University. Stewart is an adjunct professor of chemistry at the College of New Jersey and serves on several national committees reviewing analytical test methods and also provides peer review for numerous chem chemistry journals. Well, thank you both for joining us today. Kirk, why don't you get us started? Thank you, Laura. It's my pleasure to join you and Stuart today for today's presentation into investigations into method improvements for hexavalent chromium. You might ask yourself, why the recent flurry of activity regarding this uh, environmental contaminant? Well, the state of California leads the way, and the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment issued an uh, initial draft, a public health goal, if you will, for the uh, maximum allowable level of hexavalent chromium of 0 0.06 micrograms per liter or parts per billion, and this was in August of 2009. However, in December of 2010, the Environmental Working Group, a public watchdog group, released a report indicating that out of 35 cities in the U.S. that were tested, 31 of them contained elevated levels of hexavalent chrome. You might uh, uh, note that this uh, important analyte was uh, the topic of the made famous in the movie, Aaron Brockovich movie. But based on this uh, elevated uh, levels, uh, the EPA chief, Lisa Jackson, uh, appeared before the U.S. Senate and uh, confirmed that there is ongoing work on the uh, development and improvement of this uh, methodology, as well as the uh, uh, assessment. So on December of 31st uh, of, the, of 2010, the state of California released a revised draft public health goal of hexavalent chromium of 
0.02 micrograms per liter or parts per billion. So the EPA issued a press release. This is from, taken from the EPA website um, uh, recommending uh, enhancements, uh, uh, improvements for enhanced monitoring of hexavalent chrome. And uh, this can be found in uh, Dionic's uh, application update of 144, which we'll be talking about today, as well as uh, even further improvements that we've made in the past couple of months. So some of the regulatory aspects regarding hex chrome. Uh, the maximum contamination level federally is uh, 0 0.1 parts per million or 100 parts per billion. Uh, this is uh, total chromium, and uh, that's because analysis by ICPMS detects both the tri and hex and reports it as total chromium. Safe Drinking Water Act uh, requires the EPA to uh, review drinking water regulations, and this occurred in March of 2010 and there is an ongoing risk assessment uh, currently. Hexavalent chromium, uh, trivalent chrome, however, the plus three oxidation states an essential nutrient. It's actually a requirement for uh, uh, cell metabolism. However, hexavalent chrome is very toxic. And in September of 2010, uh, the Integrated Risk Information System Assessment determined that hex chrome to be a carcinogen. The traditional method of analysis, uh, EPA method 218.4, involves uh, chelation extraction followed by atomic absorption uh, measurements. Um, however, AA uh, suffers from uh, positive interferences from some metals. It can be cumbersome, not able to be automated, and it delivers modest detection limits of approximately five parts per billion. The IC method, or ion chromatographic method, is EPA method 218.6. And this, again, is an IC separation of the chromate anion, that's hexavalent chrome, coupled with a post-column reaction, so a PCR. You'll see that in sub subsequent slides. And the uh, uh, reagent, the post-column reagent used is diphenyl carboside. This uh, is used in combination with UV vis detection, and the wavelength is 530 nanometers. So this topic has been in the news for quite some time, and uh, this uh, methodology 218.6 was developed jointly by Dionics and the EPA back uh, over 20 years ago. And again, the title of that is Determination of Hex Chrome in Various Water Matrices, Drinking Water, Groundwater, wastewater effluence by ion chromatography. So the, uh, the methodology, EPA method 218.6, also uh, ASTM methodology D5257, there are no known interferences. It, it is able to be automated. And the original detection limits in the original method was 0 0.1 parts per billion. In 1988, uh, we underwent an uh, improvement to the methodology, and um, that's uh, optimized method 218.6. Again, no known interferences, able to be automated. However, this time we've lowered the detection limits to 18 parts per trillion. Here's a typical plumbing configuration used for this analysis. Starting from the top, we have our eluent. Typically, it's a, a, a strong ammonium sulfate, ammonium hydroxide uh, buffered uh, eluent system. Auto sampler's not required. It just makes life a lot easier uh, for running through multiple samples. Anytime I use a, a, a eluent, a high ionic strength eluent, as is the case here, I definitely want a non-metallic flow path, um, uh, metal-free. Don't want to have any type of metals contamination for this analysis. The sample loop is something that we've improved upon, or we've increased the size of the sample loop. And then the heart of the system is the separator columns. Uh, the ion pack AS7 uh, is used for this analysis. And prior to that, we put in the ion pack NG1, which is a neutral resin, and it traps any type of hydrophobic material that may tend to foul your separation column. AS is anion separator. After separation on the AS7, we enter a mixing manifold or mixing T, and this is where our post-column reagent is delivered. And there are several ways to do that, either pneumatically um, with a pressurized uh, bottle, pressurized reservoir, or with a pumping system, and we'll review that uh, in subsequent slides. After 
after the uh, mixing tea and the post-column reagent, we go through what we call a knitted reaction coil. This provides a tortuous path, if you will, for the uh, color-absorbing complex to form, uh, the diphenyl carboside and the uh, hexavalent chromium, and then followed by the UV vis detector, again set at 530 nanometers. I mentioned the AS7, the anion separator, ion pack AS7. This is a high capacity anion exchange column. Um, it's used for a variety of different anions, mostly polyvalent species, so very uh, highly charged negative species. Um, it's also uh, uh, able to be used for, it has a high loading capacity, so again, a high capacity column able to deal with all of the types of matrices that we could find hexavalent chromium in. So consequently, it is useful for hexachrome in um, high ionic strength uh, waters as well as soil extracts. So some of the modification that we've done, that we did in 1998 and then uh, improved upon uh, uh, this year, we used a lower sulfate buffer to adjust the sample pH. We've increased the size of the sample injected to 1,000 microliters or one mil of sample. We've reduced the eluent flow rates as well as the flow rate of the post-column reagent to, again, to allow more time for the color-absorbing complex to form, as well as increase the size of the reaction coil to 750 microliters. Again, longer path, more time, better sensitivity. And that results in a, a new MDL in reagent water of 0 0.018 micrograms per liter, which is about 15 times lower than that um, mentioned in 218.6 that was published in 1991. So Donix has been at the forefront of this uh, technique, or this important methodology for hex chrome. Starting in 1998, various applications, or the technical note, Tech Note 26 important source of information, as well as various application notes in 2000. You'll find the improvements that I just discussed in application update 144 that was published in 2003. So again, lots of uh, information available at the public website. One of the important uh, studies that we did for the application update was to see how well we, um, what the effect of the common anions, in this case sulfate and chloride, was on chromate peak response relative to the peak area. In this case, we're injecting a, or looking at a 0 0.2 parts per billion of chromate and spiked into tap water containing uh, no added sulfate or chloride. You see, we see 100% uh, response. And then uh, we look at uh, uh, good response across the board. Um, even in the presence of uh, 1,000 to 2,000 ppm of common anion contamination. So typical ground and drinking waters are not expected to contain more than 200 ppm of chloride or 500 ppm of sulfate. So good chromate response regardless of the uh, matrix ions that are present. So the most recent uh, improvement to the methodology, which we'll be outlining in the, the next few slides, was uh, is found in application update 179. This is titled Sensitive Determination of Hexavalent Chromium in Drinking Water. So this was just published uh, in uh, February of 2011. What we've done here is now instead of a four millimeter internal diameter on our AS7 column, we're using a two millimeter column. So two by 250. This, uh, on a practical basis, it uh, uh, uses less eluent, so I have to, I don't have to prepare as often. But it also improves the sensitivity when I inject the same sample size. Again, the AS7 has enough capacity to handle high ionic strength option uh, drinking water. And then some of the uh, options for post-column delivery. In the past, we've always used pneumatics through the uh, device called the PC10. But customers like to use pumping systems. Pumps are more reliable, and also we do have software control of a pumping system. So the AXP is a post-column reagent delivery system, a pump, and it allows us to control through the software 
no flow fluctuations. One of the drawbacks to using pneumatics is I do have to measure flow rates uh, periodically to make sure they're consistent. So here's a chromatogram uh, showing a, a deionized water in chromatogram A, as well as the high ionic strength water. Again, hundreds of ppm of chloride and sulfate. And you see there's uh, the same peak response. Note that the chromatograms are offset by approximately 5%, uh, but uh, again, no uh, difference in peak response regardless of the uh, strength of the matrix. This is using a 2 millimeter AS7 column, and I'm injecting 1,000 microliters or 1 mil. Here we see uh, uh, X chrome in the 2 millimeter format. This is uh, actually Sunnyvale drinking water. Um, measured at uh, 0 0.007 parts per billion. We see a DI water blank as well, and then a standard of uh, 0 0.007, and then Sunnyvale drinking water. So uh, the, uh, uh, in sample C, we often notice a large area with poor peak shape for certain samples. These are typically waters that have been chlorinated and chloraminated, which most likely results in oxidation products that react with the diphenyl carboside, the post-column reagent. But fortunately, these don't interfere with the integration of our chrome-6 peak. And so um, uh, good uh, uh, recovery here and good uh, show of, of the trace amounts of hex chrome. Here we see the results, the MDL studies, based on a 1,000 microliter injection. So in the uh, top row, we see with the 4 millimeter column, um, we see 0 0.018 parts per billion MDL. And then when we inject the same sample size onto a 2 millimeter column, we have results in much lower detection limit. So in summary, a 1 part per trillion detection limit injecting 1,000 microliters on a 2 millimeter column for hex chrome. One of the challenges is the looking at chromate in soils. And Stuart will uh, address this topic in the following section. So one of the uh, uh, challenges involves extraction. So the extraction is a two-step process. The extraction also removes other anions and metals in the soil sample. The soil oxidation reduction potential, the pH, the presence of sulfides or manganese and iron, again, affect the extraction efficiency. So the real concern here is to make sure that you can maintain the integrity of the hex chrome and not oxidize or have conversions of the chrome 3 to chrome 6. The analysis using EPA 7199 is uh, very similar to the EPA method 218.6, and the accuracy depends on the type of, on the preservation buffer that's used and the eluents. There's been a proposal to, instead of using ammonium hydroxide, ammonium sulfate as the eluent and pH adjustment system, to use lithium hydroxide. Here we see a chromatogram using the two different eluent systems on an AS7 column. So the, uh, the longer retention time uh, is a re result with the lithium hydroxide because it's a weaker eluent. And the longer the retention time, the wider the peak area, which might compromise our sensitivity and uh, also doubles the run time. So you see the, uh, with ammonium hydroxide, we have good sensitivity and good uh, elution time. Also, lithium hydroxide, lithium sulfate uh, buffer system, or eluent system is not a buffer. Lithium hydroxide is not available as a concentrated solution as ammonium hy hydroxide is. Lithium hydroxide costs roughly five times that of, of comparable sodium hydroxide. And then the lithium sulfate is more expensive. And most importantly, lithium salts are uh, moderately toxic, while sodium and ammonium salts are not. This slide shows our results for the analysis of hex chrome from a NIST soil sample, NIST 2700. The reported concentration of chrome 6 is 550 milligrams per kilogram, which was analyzed by ICPMS. From our extraction using EPA method 3060A, we got similar one-third lower results at around 384 to 389 milligrams per kilogram using EPA 7199 analytical method. 
So there was virtually no difference in the amounts between the two eluents, either ammonium hydroxide or lithium hydroxide. But we decided to go a step further and do a second extraction on the same soil sample that was extracted previously. Combining the results from these extracts, we show a significant increase to 450 milligrams per kilogram, though still not close to the amount reported. This suggests that the extraction step has limitations in the analysis of hex chrome in soils. So in conclusion, the improvements to EPA method 218.6, as outlined uh, in, this pre in this presentation, are sufficient to meet the uh, proposed MDL as well as the public health goals from the state of California. Um, EPA method uh, 218.6, uh, 7199 can also be used for soil sample in addition to water matrices. And the discrepancies with known standards are mainly due to poor extraction efficiencies and also known metals that interfere with the hex chrome extraction. Thank you, and I'll hand it over to Stuart. Thank you, Kirk. So we have a nice segue here to focus for a while on the analyses of hexavalent chromium in soils. The first slide, which I'll show you, which has some maps and a picture, uh, tells a little story. There's, you see the state of New Jersey and a highlight on the right of the areas where about 200 sites of known hexavalent chromium contamination have been found. The reason why the, uh, the small photo of James Gandolfini as Tony Soprano is is superimposed here is that many of these sites in the northern part of New Jersey are uh, actually were shown on the Sopranos TV sh series and are actually quite close to many of these uh, chromium contaminated sites. So a little bit of the history here about hexavalent chromium in New Jersey. Uh, it's mostly a soils issue. Uh, in uh, for most of the 20th century, there were several large chemical companies that produced um, chromite ore processing residue, which is abbreviated copra. And a lot of this was land applied all throughout those areas in northern New Jersey that was shown on the previous maps. Uh, hexavalent chromium, as Kirk has mentioned, is a carcinogen and has been reported to cause both GI cancers and uh, gastroenterological, uh, gastroenterological cancers as well as lung cancers. And these are elevated in areas uh, in residents that live close to these contaminated sites. Uh, the department, in addition to uh, working with EPA, has been um, active in trying to remediate these sites for several decades. And this is uh, a complicated process, both scientifically, uh, legally, and in every other way. Um, the important thing to note here for the purposes of this discussion is that the cleanup standard for hexavalent chromium in soil is currently set at 20 parts per million. And just keep that number in mind as we go forward. So uh, Kirk mentioned uh, the issue about um, uh, hexavalent chromium in soil and why, and why it's, it's an issue and really is a more complicated issue than uh, the analysis of hexavalent chromium in drinking water, primarily because you can have both oxidation and reduction depending upon the pH and the potential of the soil. So at high potential and high pH, as the chart shows, we're going to have primarily the hexavalent form at low pH, low potential, the trivalent form, where, where you have uh, areas close to the border uh, as shown by that dashed line through, through the middle of this graph, you can have both oxidation and or reduction occurring, and that happens for many soils. Uh, if you have hexavalent chromium that's there, that's oxidized, you won't see it, uh, or you'll see more of it. Rather, if you have hexavalent chromium there is reduced, you won't see uh, as much as being measured. So the analysis, which again, Kirk, uh, alluded to in his presentation involves two steps. There's digestion method, EPA method 3060A, and EPA gives you three method options for detection. 7196A, a uh, colorimetric method manual, 7199, which Kirk described, and method 6800, species isopollution mass spectrometry. So the issues uh, with measurement, uh, Again, Kirk mentioned some of this already, but I'll just review it here, is that the concern is either oxidation of chrome 3 to chrome 6 or reduction of chrome 6 to chrome 3. Either or both can occur when we're, do, when we're analyzing a soil extract of hexavalent chromium. Um, and in addition to the extraction method, some of the determinative methods that we can use, uh, 7196A or 7199, can also be involved in affecting the measured amount of hexavalent chromium. 
So some of the other concerns that are shown on this slide about um, the analysis of hexavalent chromium in soil is that method 3060A does not automatically reject data that fails method QC. Uh, this is perhaps unique in, in many EPA methods, but you can actually use data for regulatory purposes that fails method QC. Uh, what do you do with a value that has a low spike, which suggests we may be under-measuring hexavalent chromium in soil? How do you know that a given sample, uh, which may vary in composition from another sample, how do you know that the sample that's spiked is representative of all the samples in your sample batch? And can you achieve whatever the reporting limit is necessary for your project objectives? So for the determinative methods, each of them has issues. A method 7196A, a colorimetric method using diphenylcarbazide derivatization, is rather time consuming and has a relati relatively high reporting limit. Method 7199, which Kirk spoke about, has better reporting limits. However, it cannot uh, adjust for species interconversion so that either in the digestion or the measurement phase, if we have uh, chromium-3 oxidizing or hexavalent chromium reducing, we can't adjust for that. Method 6800, uh, species 8 isolate dilution mass spectrometry, can do that if the species interconversion is less than 80%. Uh, unfortunately, we, it's a very expensive method to perform due to the fact that it requires isotopically labeled standards, and there is limited commercial availability um, in, the, in the laboratory community at present. So one of the issues that uh, was faced by the community in looking at how do we quality assure hexavalent chromium measurements in soils was to have a standard. And uh, this was uh, an issue that we addressed uh, in collaboration with uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, EPA, and Rutgers University. Uh, the, the design objective was to prepare uh, one or more reference materials that would uh, have a known concentration by various analytical techniques in a real sample. Uh, the samples that we chose were collected at Woodby State Park, uh, and they were homogenized at USGS, and then we conducted an comparison to try to quantify the exavalent chromium that was in those samples. So here was the actual sample site. This is actually some photos taken during the sample collection phase, and this site is near the interpretive center at uh, Woodby State Park. And as a New York native and a New Jersey resident, I can tell you that the best view of the Statue of Liberty, uh, which is shown at the top, is actually from the New Jersey side. And that's a photo taken on a, on a hazy November day when we actually collect these samples. Lower left, we see the project team, uh, Rachel Ellis, my colleague at the New Jersey DEP, and um, the center, Bruce McDonald, and to the right, uh, Steve Long of NIST. Uh, you can actually see in the far right the actual uh, sample excavation. Uh, those uh, bright uh, reddish areas are actually outcroppings of the culprit material, the areas with, with high values of hexavalent chromium. Um, Intercomparison at two phases, one to establish homogeneity of the sample, and then to actually um, um, quantify the results. And you can see the data is pretty similar. We have data, all the, all the, all the digestions were done by 3060A, and the, um, we have separate data for 7196A, 7199, and 1600 measurements. Uh, NIST did uh, their own independent uh, SIDMS measurements isotope dilution mass spectrometry measurements. You can see here, as Kirk alluded to earlier, that there is a significant difference between the measured values by both 7196A and 7199 and 6800. Uh, NIST has certified this material, uh, NIST SRM uh, 2701, as, as at 551 ppm of hexavalent chromium in that soil. And what this says is that if you're using either 7196A or 7199 to measure it, you're going to be reporting about 30, 35% lower hexavalent chromium in your soil extract than you would if you use the certified value determined by uh, SIDMS. So the certificate, this is a copy of certificate for the uh, SRM. And I want to point you to the total chrome value. Uh, which was done here by X-ray fluorescence and nutrient activation analyses. So that's going to become important in addressing some of the concerns that Kirk raised earlier about are we actually measuring all the hexavalent chromium in the sample. So this is an addendum to the certificate, and addendums or appendices on this certificates are, the, are data that is reported for informational value, typically reported by um, US EPA methods. Uh, these methods, just like 
many EPA methods do not necessarily um, imply that we're getting all the material out. It's an operationally defined parameter that says if you run this digestion method and that extraction and that determinative method, here's what you should achieve. So by method 7196A and 7199, we have the hexavalent chromium values. But remember back the few slides before, we showed a value for a total chromium in this, in this SRM as being about 4%. Note here that by using the acid leach and ICP, we get about 0.4%. And if we do method 3052 uh, and ICP, we're getting only 1%. So getting a significantly lower amount of hexavalent of, of total chromium. That's total chromium in these samples. And again, what does that mean for the measured about of hexavalent chromium that we're getting in these samples? So some of the observations from this data that I uh, previously spoke about was that the uh, method 6800 results, the isotope dilution mass spectrometry results, are about 35% higher than either 7196 or 7199, suggesting that some reduction is occurring in the measurement techniques that can't be corrected for by the 7196A, 7199 methods. Um, note at the very bottom, there are uh, the blue line and the red line. We're only getting uh, less than 10% of the total chromium removed by 3050 and ICP, and only about 20% by 3052 ICP. So uh, what does that mean for 3060A? Does it get all the chromium, hexavalent chromium, out of the sample? Are we actually measuring? all the hexavalent chromium that's in that sample. So uh, some application studies to show you the importance of this and to show you that even though there may be issues with um, the measurement and reduction, um, use of the reference material can be critically important in evaluating data and show us that the data can be used even though um, there may be issues with how much of the actual hexavalent chromium we're measuring. The first study I'll talk about very briefly is a application study for soils and hexavalent chromium in New Jersey. And uh, this was triggered by a risk assessment study which showed that rather than the 20 part per million standard, which I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, that the actual uh, health level that um, would need to be done for cleanups may actually be closer to one part per million, which is a significant difference, going from 20 to one. So uh, the department decided we needed to come up with a background to see um, is one part per million in soil for hexavalent chromium, is that um, above or below what a background soil might be relative to what a contaminated soil might be. So we decided to collect the number of soils around the state, analyze them for hexavalent chromium, and we did that by both um, uh, the method pair 3060A7199, and also the method pair 3060A6800. And the addition to the study was that we decided to use the reference material as a QA, a uh, separate QA material, which I'll show you in a moment. So here's the data. So if you use the um, method QC, we get almost 100% recovery of the soluble and insoluble spikes by method 7199. However, if we take a look at what we get, if we use 25 milligrams of the SRM and dilute it to 2.5 grams of soil, may essentially make a 1 to 100 dilution, we only get back about 60% of what we should have added. Again, this, suggest, this is suggestive of the fact that the soil matrix is reducing some of the hexavalent chromium in the SRM and is making it not available for measurement by 7199. However, if you look at the 6800 column, what we see is that if we're able to correct for this oxidation reduction effect, uh, we can get almost 100% of the true value in this material by um, use of IDMS. So um, some of the important conclusions from this particular study, from the QA part of it, which is still, and it's, it's, as you mentioned, this study is still an internal review, um, is that um, while method 6800 can provide the correction for the reduction, we can use the NIST appendix values to assess data quality via the 7196A or 7199 data sets. Again, what we have here is the ability to use the appendix values and compare the measured values of those appendix values rather to the certified value. And this is an important uh, observation uh, that is only available if you're able to use the reference material as part of your um, quality assurance for your project detail. Uh, 
a separate study was done where we tested the ability of laboratories to measure hexavalent chromium in soil and found that most could achieve uh, very reliably at the 0.5 ppm level, which is uh, comforting because the cleanup standard at some point might have to go as low as 1. The second application study to give you uh, a non-New Jersey example was a study that was done in Missouri. Uh, there was a tannery that uh, disposed of some tannery waste material, uh, supposedly as, as uh, fertilizer. Unfortunately, it was contaminated with hexavalent chromium. This study was done using method 7199 and used the NIST SRM for QC. Uh, and it should be mentioned that as part of method 7199, the use of a reference material as QC is required for every sample delivery group. Here we see some of the data. This is courtesy of my colleagues at the uh, Missouri DNR. Um, again, they saw that for the NIST SRM, they're only getting about 70% of the certified value back as a spike. Again, that doesn't mean the data is not usable. What it means is that you need to use the appendix values to quality assure your data and um, uh, adjust for them or, or consider them in your data evaluations um, rather than using the um, certified value, again, which is done by uh, high still pollution mass spectrometry, which can correct for interconversion, whereas uh, 7199 cannot. You see here there was a strong correlation between uh, total organic carbon and um, the recovery of the spike, and uh, this is believed to be a factor in one of the mechanisms which would cause hexavalent chromium to reduce trivalent. So one of the other things that we did here uh, as, a, as to prepare a, a suite of quality assurance tools was to prepare a lower level hexavalent chromium standard. Uh, 550 parts per million is, is a high level for most people. Uh, most uh, soils that are analyzed as oil chromic considerably lower than that. So what we did was to pair a 1 to 40 dilution of the SRM 2701, called it 2700, and conducted the same sort of intercomparison that was done for the parent material uh, to analyze the um, composition. Here you can see some of the data. Uh, interestingly, the data shows that, again, we see about 35 to 40 percent lower values for 7190, they say 7199 data as compared to the isotope dilution mass spectrometry data. Uh, all the stoichiometry is confirmed, both for total and hexavalent chromium. Everything seems to work. And the, neither the, um, and so the native courses of hexavalent chromium seem to be unaffected neither by dilution or by mixing to prepare this material. Uh, the comparisons here are eerily similar to. Uh, what we saw for 2701. So this gives us a second material that's available for lower-level work, uh, lower-level concentrations of soils for hexavalent chromium where those are, are appropriate. So we get back to the original question. Um, what about the efficiency of digestion? What Kirk showed in his presentation was subsequent uh, uh, multiple extractions, uh, one extraction after the other, would gets more and more chromium out, which again is very suggestive of the fact that the original extraction might not remove all the hexavalent chromium in the soil. But how can we actually prove that? Well, one of the ways we can do this is by using a non-invasive measurement technique, a non-extraction-based measurement technique. And one of our options here is Zanes. And this is the work of uh, Julian Malbert at NIST, uh, which looked at uh, the extraction efficiency of various materials, including uh, the culprit material upon which NIST 2701 is based, to see exactly what's happening with uh, the extraction efficiency of hexavalent chromium in soil. Uh, ZANES, for those who are unfamiliar with the technique, is, is an acronym for X-ray absorption near-edge structure, and it involves a, um, a cyclotron uh, to uh, produce X-rays um, uh, at high energy impact. And this is obviously not something that can be done in a routine commercial laboratory. This will never be a certified analytical method. But as a diagnostic tool or as an investigatory tool, it's certainly uh, very, very important. And this is a, a uh, very short summary of, uh, of Dr. Malbert's uh, excellent work. Uh, let me walk you through this. What he did here was take the data for the SRM 2701 done by extraction. And the certified values are 550 parts per million of hexavalent chromium and a total chromium concentration of 4.26%. So therefore, based upon that data by extraction, 
uh, hexavalent chromium represents about 1.3% of the total chromium in the sample simply by, by doing a simple division. Uh, the analysis that uh, he conducted of the culprit material shows that there should be about 9% of hexavalent chromium in this material. Not 1.3, but 9%, which is suggest that they're only getting out about 14% of the available indigenous hexavalent chromium using the method 3060A extraction. When this method was applied to other types of soils, other types of materials, uh, much different and indeed better hexavalent chromium uh, recoveries were found. So this is this um, low recovery, this 14% recovery, is not illustrative of every soil type or every sample type, but certainly for the type of sample we're dealing here, you know, copra, uh, in a New Jersey soil, it reflects the fact that we, again, may not be getting out all the hexavalent chromium that's there. And remember back to the discussion we had earlier about total chromium. We only got between 10 and 20% of the total chromium out. Here we're suggesting we're only getting out about 14% of the hexavalent chromium. So again, there is some um, consistency there. So in conclusion, um, I think we can say fairly confidently that analysis of hexavalent chromium for soils is a little bit more complicated than that for waters. Uh, we do have some issues involving both the extraction techniques and as well as the determinative techniques in terms of measuring hexavalent chromium. Use of SRMs uh, can enable you to deal, we think, effectively with existing data by either method 7196 or 7199. Certainly method 6800 is available if you want a definitive value for the extractable concentration of hexavalent chromium in the soil. And uh, I think this um, offers us some additional information that can be useful in helping us to, to, to interpret uh, this important analytical assay. So with that, I'll conclude our remarks and uh, turn uh, the session back over to Laura. Well, thank you very much. Thank you both for those informative presentations. Before we get started with the Q&A session, I just want to remind the audience how to submit questions. All you have to do is type your questions in the small text box, which is located in the lower left-hand side of your screen, and then click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we can. All right, so let me pull up my questions here, and let's see our first question. Um, so this viewer wants to know, what is the proper way of using the mixing tea? I've seen it used so many different ways. Uh, question, uh, Kirk, do you want to handle that one? Uh, of course. Thank you, Laura. Um, actually, the uh, mixing tea, there's only basically an inlet and an outlet, or you know, three-way mixing tea. So um, uh, the uh, reaction takes place in the knitted reaction coil. So um, you know, you certainly have your effluent out of your column into one port, uh, your post-column reagent into the other port, and then on to your um, uh, knitted reaction coil. So. Um, the um, you know the 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 length and the size of the reaction coil is should be sufficient for the reaction to take place. Excellent. Next question is for Stuart. Do you believe that the diluted NIST standard analysis by 7199 represents the achievable sensitivity level of one ppm for native soils? Well, I think some of the data in one of the slides shows that we actually did a study where we spiked a known amount of, of hexavalent chromium using the SRM uh, to uh, some background soil and were able to quantify quite accurately at about half the value, about 0.5 ppm. So uh, one ppm in soil is achievable, probably considerably lower than that. Okay. Another question for you. Uh, what is the MDL for chromium-6 on an ICPMS? For can you repeat that question again? Yes. What is the MDL for chromium-6 on an ICPMS? Well, again, keep in mind that ICPMS traditionally is a total metals measurement technology uh, so that we don't specifically look at hexavalent chromium per se uh, by ICPMS. Uh, if we're looking at total chromium by ICPMS, typically 0.1 ppm or even lower is achievable. A lot of it depends upon the cleanliness of the room and other reagent issues, uh, but certainly 0.1 ppm for total chromium would be achievable by ICPMS. Okay. Uh, Kirk, this is for you. Can I use the same method for drinking water samples or soil extracts? Um, yes, of course. You can use the same IC method. The anal analysis method can be the same. Okay. And why is a 2-millimeter system more sensitive than a 4-millimeter configuration? 
Um, actually, it's because we're actually putting more mass on column. Um, a thousand microliter sample loop injected onto a two millimeter column is equivalent to a, a four four thousand microliter injection valve injected onto a four millimeter. So we're just put, pr putting more analyte, more mass on a column. Okay. Um, next one is for Stuart. What do you do with soils data that shows that method 7199 is only measuring about 70% of the available hexavalent chromium? Well, the, 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 the short answer is you use it. Um, the, um, the QA criteria of method 3060A um, ask you to examine the QC data that's done. Uh, if the values of the spikes in method 3060A are lower than 75%, they ask you to redo the batch. But if those values are uh, lower, um, what you do is report the data and use it. I think the important thing for my presentation is that, again, if, you, if you're using a reference material that has a certified value and a reference value, and the reference values are indeed showing lower recoverable hexavalent chromium concentrations, you can then help use those data to interpret your results if it's necessary. Now, you have situations where this may not even be an issue. Let me give you an example, if that, if I may. Let's say you have a cleanup standard. Let's say it's currently, as it is in New Jersey, of 20 parts per million. And let's say, for example, that you're measuring hexavalent chromium in your sample, and you get 100 parts per million by seven, method 7199. Well, if your data is going to be lower by 30%, that value might be less than what's actually there by extraction. It really doesn't matter if it's 30% lower. It's still well above your standard. Similarly, if your cleanup standard is 20 and you're measuring 1 or 2 ppm, again, the fact that you're 30% lower probably doesn't affect your regulatory decision. This really only plays into the very limited number of situations where you're at the margins, where you're close to the cleanup standard, where having the data from the SRM, having that reference value, could be important to help you interpret the data. Okay, very good. Uh, another question, uh, also for Stuart. As, an, as a specialist in inorganic chemistry, do you think the future of hexavalent, hexavalent chromium analysis is with EPA method 218.6 and EPA 6800? Well, I think, the, I think the issue really is that both methods, both 7199 and 6800, are useful. Uh, I think method 6800 certainly as a definitive analytical tool has a, has a very important place in helping laboratories and regulators analyze data. I think the, the real issue is what we do about the extraction technique, about 3060A. Um, EPA has struggled with this before. Originally, method 3060 back in the 90s was withdrawn and replaced by 3060A. Uh, I don't think anyone in the regulatory community is particularly enamored of it, thinks that it works perfectly, and certainly some of the data by Dr. Valbert suggests that there may be issues with COPER-type samples. Uh, but until we have a replacement for it, until we have an option, um, again, these are all operationally defined analyses. And, um, the way we're, we're dealing with these issues is, is by EPA-approved methods and method 3060A is the extraction method and method 7199 or 218.6 and 6800 are the ways we would, we would make a determination of what's in the extract. Very good. Uh, here's a question for Kirk. Do you have to guard samples from oxidation or reduction before testing? And for example, do you add reagents for shipping or refrigeration or light? Um, of course, you have to uh, stabilize the uh, samples, and uh, that's typically done with a, a pH adjustment using the uh, eluent system or the buffer system. Um, it, it's always good practice to uh, uh, keep your samples refrigerated as well as uh, to protect from light. Very good. Uh, for Stuart, um, depending on the pH, chromium-3 can be oxidized to chromium-6. How do you evaluate the kinetics of oxidation? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I, 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 was, I could certainly design an experiment to do that, uh, but the, the, the issue is really what's in the specific soil you're talking about. And if, if we've learned anything for, for having studied uh, hexavalent chromium in soil extracts for years, it's, each soil is a little bit different uh, depending upon what's, what else is in the soil beyond the hexavalent chromium uh, can make a big difference. So uh, the kinetics of the oxidation and reduction is, is, a, 
is a is a complex process that probably deserves a separate a separate study. I just wanted to uh, to uh, speak a little bit about the the, the previous question that, that Kirk addressed very well. Um, I know that EPA is currently looking at holding time issues involving hexavalent chromium analysis and to do some studies along those lines. So there should be some some guidance from EPA on those issues out in the hopefully the not too distant future. Very good. Another question for you. Um, is XRF emerging as a useful, inexpensive analytical tool that can replace ICPMS? That is a very good question. Um, actually, the Missouri study that I, I spoke about briefly, and again, this is certainly not my work, but uh, EPA um, did a lot of work with the state of Missouri and actually characterized the, um, the chromium contamination uh, largely using X-ray fluorescence. Uh, so it definitely has a place. In, uh, one of the one of the sort of misgivings I have as someone who, who spends a lot of time with metals analyses is that, from an environmental perspective, X-ray fluorescence really isn't used a lot. Um, it's mostly you know digestion and, and, and measurement by by things like uh, ICP or ICPMS for, for for total metals. I think X-ray fluorescence has a, has a big place, particularly in in characterizing soil sites, and uh, I really wish it was used more. Very good. Another question for you. Uh, this one's kind of long, but the EPA has included language in method 3050B that indicates that even though the results of the digestion are not truly total, they represent the concentrations that are significant in the environment. Is it likely that EPA will make a similar statement regarding method 3060A? Well, I think that question probably is better addressed to, to, uh, to EPA than to me. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of beg off on that one a little bit. But again, I think the point to be made here, and I think it's an important one if, if as a take-home message, is that you know, no EPA method um, uh, purports to measure total concentrations. Uh, they're all, and the term I like to use a lot is operationally defined. It's whatever the method removes from the sample that applies to exavalent chromium, it applies to metals in general, it applies certainly to organics. Uh, as well, so it's not limited to this, this subject of this talk today. So if the question is how much is truly in the sample, uh, that's a very different question than what does the EPA method tell you about what's in the sample, and uh, the art form of interpreting data is making the connection between those two subjects. Okay, another question going back to different kinds of methods. Which soil method is currently the best one to analyze the hexavalent chromium? And what is the quantitation limit for it? Is that to me? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, repeat that question one more time. Sure. What soil, me soil method is currently the best to analyze hexavalent chromium, and what's the quantitation limit for that method? Well, again, we spoke a little bit about the, the quantitation limit for method 7199, which is um, certainly uh, 0.5 is a reasonable limit. Uh, it certainly has been demonstrated you can work there. Um, method 6800 is considerably more sensitive than that, and probably as much by as much of a factor of 10, perhaps uh, five to 10. Um, the issue with method 6800, though, is that um, in our uh, certification program in New Jersey, we only have one certified laboratory for method 6800, and uh, the cost because they use isotopic standards. Um, the cost for that analysis is between $500 and $1,000 per sample, whereas the cost for method 7199 commercially might be uh, one-tenth of that. So again, you have to weigh your options here, and um, certainly for routine analysis, um, method 7199 is perfectly acceptable. Again, there are issues with, with um, recoveries and, 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 and quantitation, which, which I spoke about at some length. But again, using the reference material uh, enables you to make some, some sound judgments about what data you're getting out uh, of your analysis and can help you move forward expeditiously and, and make, um, to make appropriate regulatory judgments. Very good. Uh, here's a question for Kirk, just sort of a question about terminology. Uh, this user points out the use of the abbreviation PCR, uh, PCR is also, also used as an abbreviation for polymer chain reactions. Could a different abbreviation be used here? Um, I suppose so, but uh, yeah, post-column reaction is uh, uh, the, what we refer to it as. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure a lot of DNA chemists are interested in hex chrome, but. <laughs> Very good. Um, Question back to Stuart. In what way can 3060A be improved? Oh, gee. Uh, what a question. Um, 
we have struggled with that in New Jersey. We've had research contracts. Um, some of the best minds in the country, uh, Brian Buckley at, at Rutgers, who's a colleague of ours, has looked at this, and um, um, other people in the industry have looked at this. And frankly, if there was a better mousetrap here, we would use it, <laughs> present it to EPA, and, 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 uh, and ditch 3060A and get something better. Uh, there really isn't anything better out there. The, um, the, the ability to, to quantitatively extract hexavalent chromium from a variety of soils to do so uh, completely and maintain the indigenous oxidation state is a very, very, very challenging assay. And um, I know people are working on it now, and hopefully there will be some success in, in the future, but we have what we have, and we need to deal with what we have. Um, so I wish there was a better answer than that, but that's the best I can do for the moment. Very good. A uh, question for Kirk. Is the instrument commercially available for the measurement of chromium-6 down to a, um, a detection limit of 0 0.02 parts per billion or lower in drinking water? Um, yes. Uh, virtually any of our IC systems, uh, uh, except for the ICS-900, can achieve that. And if you look in application update 179, we did use a um, ICS 2100. So um, uh, short answer is yes, uh, the instrument is available. Very good. Um, all right. Well, I think we're out of time now, so we're going to have to wrap it up. Well, thank you both for your insights. And I uh, want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and for their participation in today's event. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Dionics Corporation, for making today's educational webcast possible. Please note that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of next year, and you'll receive an email from LCGC North America alerting you when the webcast is available for replay. We ask that you forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.